thank you very much indeed for coming on this evening. I've certainly been very much looking forward to this myself. I'm sure all of you have too. It's my uh, great pleasure and privilege to introduce this evening Professor Kimberly Kim Fazan, who is the uh, Harrison Robertson and Cadellan Chapman Professor of Law at the uh, University of Virginia, uh, and formerly of the, uh, the Rutgers Law School, where she was also a distinguished professor. And uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell very many of you, but for, for the benefit of those who don't know, uh, Kim is one of the leading and most distinguished writers and thinkers on criminal law and criminal law theory working in the world today. Uh, she is internationally distinguished uh, and as the co-editor-in-chief of the, the well-known journal Law and Philosophy, and is also on the editorial boards of Legal Theory and Criminal Law and Philosophy. So, uh, uh, an intellectual stranglehold over the main uh, publication outlet you <laughs> criminal law thinkers. So, for any of you who think you're publishing, you better make a good impression this evening. Uh, and um, the reason, uh, it, 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 in part from all that, apart from her uh, well known sense of fairness and dedication to the discipline, is the fact that, of course, she is. Uh, recognized uh, so widely as a leading scholar. Uh, she's the author of numerous uh, criminal law articles uh, and the very well-known uh, uh, work that she completed uh, chiefly with Larry Alexander and also Stephen Moore's Crime and Culpability, A Theory of Criminal Law, published by Cambridge University Press. But it's not just about that book. Um, uh, her paper, Beyond Crime and Commitment, was selected for the 2013 American Philosophical Association's uh, Berger Memorial Prize uh, for the best paper written in law and philosophy for the previous two years. A very, very significant uh, and unique distinction. Um, similarly, um, her, uh, uh, a little further back, her paper, Beyond Intention, which I remember very well indeed, was selected for the 2006 Stanford Yale Junior Faculty Forum in the category of criminal law. So, um, Kim has an absolutely outstanding record uh, in the field of publication in criminal law and uh, uh, the philosophy of criminal law. And it's uh, a real privilege for us to listen to her today. And I'm very much looking forward to her paper. I'm sure we all are. So um, could I invite you to welcome Kim with uh, uh, a round of applause. Good evening. Thank you all for uh, coming here tonight. Uh, I very much look forward to sharing this work in progress with you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for that uh, lovely and extremely kind introduction. Uh, so I'm currently co-authoring a book with Larry Alexander, again, entitled Reflections on Crime and Culpability, Problems and Puzzles. So our first book, Crime and Culpability, reimagined criminal law in various ways. And yet even after having written that book, we discovered that there were many additional problems in criminal law theory, questions that either our uh, book presupposed or that were at the periphery of our previous arguments, and that they were equally challenging. So this book tries to tackle those puzzles, and many of these puzzles are not just problems for us and our view of the criminal law, but are problems for criminal law theorists more generally. So this lecture is the final chapter of the book, and it deals with puzzles that retributivists have to confront when making decisions about how to give people what they deserve. So let me begin with a bit of background. Uh, punishing someone harms them, right? We generally think it's a bad thing to harm people. So if we're going to harm someone, we need a good reason to do so. Uh, we're familiar with the typical sorts of justifications that we have for punishment, right? So one is we want to deter other wrongdoers. Another is we might want to lock someone up to incapacitate him so he can't hurt other people. Another point would be that we punish somebody because punishment will be sufficiently unpleasant that the wrongdoer will decide not to commit another crime. But there's another important reason to punish, and that's because the offender deserves it. Uh, and desert functions in two different ways. So first, we might think that it's simply wrong to punish people who don't deserve. So we might get a lot of general deterrence if we took an innocent person and framed him for a crime, uh, but we don't think that that's permissible, and that's because, because the person uh, is innocent because they're not deserving of punishment, it's impermissible to punish that person. But there's also another side to retributivism, and that's the side that says the fact that someone deserves punishment is a reason, though theorists debate how strong a reason it is, to in favor of punishing that person. Because my talk tonight centers around how to give people what they deserve, 
uh, it is an exercise in this part of retributivism. Though we should also remember that retributivists think it's critically important that someone is blameworthy before you punish the offender at all. So I'll first sketch out a bit of what I mean by being a retributivist and what I think it is that people deserve. Uh, from there, I plan to address two main questions. First, does retributivism have anything to say about when, how, and whom among the deserving we ought to punish? And the short answer to that question is, not really. I will then turn to puzzles in which the prior, prior distributions might affect the distribution of desert. There is the familiar problem of different susceptibility to punishment, right? So a fine uh, is experienced quite differently by the poor than by the rich. Second, I'll address whether other harmings count towards deserved punishment. If the defendant has suffered undeserved harm in the past, can that, punish, can that undeserved harm be set off against what they deserve now? And my controversial answer to that question will be yes. So let me begin by explicating what Larry Alexander and I mean by retributive desert, what we take it to consist in. I will occasionally use we when I say we. I'm not intending the royal we, but the Larry and Kim we. Uh, so just so you're wondering when I say we, who the we are that I am talking about. OK, so first, I take retributive uh, desert to be non-comparative. What one deserves is independent of how or if others are punished. When A and B commit identical wrongs, and A receives the punishment he deserves, but B does not, uh, he receives less or no punishment, A cannot complain as a matter of retributive justice that his punishment is unjust and that he has been wronged by the failure to punish B. A has gotten what he deserves. There may be some external fairness concerns in the fact that A is being punished and B is not, but in fact, there's no objection that comes from the fact that now A's punishment is somehow now undeserved. So anyone who is a parent can actually recognize this sort of claim when your child comes home and complains that they were punished, but Timmy, who was also engaged in the wrongdoing, was not punished. That never seems to be a very good argument for why your child's allowed to complain that they didn't get, that he got something he didn't deserve, right? Sure, maybe Timmy should also have been punished, but you, child, are not entitled to complain about it. Second, we take the currency of dessert to be suffering. The various modes of punishment that have been used throughout history all aim to cause the offender to experience suffering. Now, it is true that we often think that punishment also involves stigma and censure. And this stigma and censure are built into our notion that punishment expresses blame and is tied to our notions of expressing blame and expressing our moral norms. When we impose upon someone the punishment he deserves, we're both intending that he that deserves suffering and expressing these attitudes. Ultimately, then, it may be that the human practice of punishment involves both censure and suffering. But we take it that what uh, retributive desert consists in is just the suffering itself. We also take it to be intrinsically good that offenders get what they deserve. So the classic way that people have been thinking about this and what Patrick Tomlin points to is that our intuitions really get going through the negation of that, that we are really troubled by the notion that somebody could deserve punishment and walk around without being punished at all. Right? So we might imagine, as Victor Tadros does, that Hitler is alive and well and living on an island. And imagine that you could press one of two buttons, and no one will know, and no general deterrence will come from this or anything else. You can push the button that makes it rain on Hitler's island, or you can press the button that makes it sunny on Hitler's island. Now, Tadros's view is that it ought to be sunny on Hitler's island, because Hitler's life has gone so poorly by virtue of being Hitler. Uh, but I strongly disagree with that. Instead, I vote for monsoon season. I'm pushing the rainy button. I'm pushing it many times. So Tadros actually faults retributivists for lacking an argument for the intrinsic goodness of retributive desert. And it is, in fact, true that establishing the intrinsic goodness of something is a, a really difficult argument to make. So our book chapter tries to make it in many different ways. But for tonight, I'm just going to try potentially two intuition uh, pumps uh, with you. So the first is to consider W.D. Ross's hypothetical. And you imagine two different imaginary states of the universe, alike in the total amounts of virtue and vice and of pleasure and pain. But in one world, the virtuous are all happy and the vicious are all suffering. 
And in the other world, all of the virtuous are suffering and the vicious are happy. And you ask, which is a better state of the universe? And uh, Ross's claim is few people would hesitate to say that the first was a much better state of the universe than the second. Tadros, in contrast, again, who believes the vicious have already had the misfortune of being vicious, while the virtuous have already had the benefit of being good, would have to decidedly side for the second world. Second, consider this puzzle raised by philosopher Leo Zybert. Who gets punished and why are remar remarkably uh, irrelevant to somebody like Tadros. So if you assume that R assaults V, right, and we usually think then R is supposed to be punished and have suffering. If you think that's not a good thing, then it doesn't matter to you whether when R assaults V, R experiences suffering, or when R assaults V, some random bystander uh, experiences suffering. Those are equally bad states of the world to someone like Tadros. A final line of argument that we find persuasive is based on positive dessert claims. A dessert denier must deny that it's good when individuals who perform heroic acts are rewarded for their behavior. But do heroes not deserve praise, thanks, and for their lives to go well? Ultimately, we join Shelley Kagan in thinking a world in which people are getting what they deserve is a better one than a world in which they are not. So this is hardly a full defense of the idea that the currency of retributive desert is suffering and that it's intrinsically good for people to get what they deserve. Hopefully, however, it's sufficient for us to turn to the questions at hand. So administering retributive desert raises several questions. First, does it matter when retributive desert is administered? Second, does retributive desert care about how punishment is administered? That is the mode of punishment. Finally, in a world in which resource constraints prevent everyone from being punished who deserves it, how do we select among the deserving? So let's start with when and how. Patrick Tomlin thinks retributivists must prefer, prefer short, severe punishments. Tomlin once again focuses on the corollary of the view that it's intrinsically good that wrongdoers get what they deserve, namely that it's intrinsically bad when wrongdoers don't get what they deserve. So then he surveys different approaches to the timing question, including what he calls the brute time view. That is that the more time that passes, the more injustice there is. And the in the end view, that all that matters is that the person receives what he deserves before he dies. And Tomlin comes to the conclusion that all versions of retributivism should prefer short, severe punishments to long, mild ones. This is because on the brute time view, every day that goes by, there's greater injustice. It's like having a debt and accruing interest every day. Uh, and in the in the end view, uh, it raises the concern that the person could die before they're actually punished. So we're generally sympathetic to the in the end view. Ultimately, what matters is that before one dies, one's moral ledger is balanced. The question is why, if that's what matters, there seems to be something amiss if the actor does not get his just desserts now. Why do we feel the pull of the intuition better now than later? So we suspect that there are, this is a product of a number of concerns. The first is just epistemic, right? This is why Tomlin notes that the in the end view only contingently supports short, severe punishments. Someone might die without receiving his just desserts, but that's not actually the same as saying that that person will die. Hence, the in the end view is not concerned that justice delayed is justice denied. It would only object when justice delayed results in no justice at all. Relatedly, future punishment might become impossible. As Tomlin notes, the in the end view runs into problems with personal identity. So if you think that as people change, as time goes by, uh, they may deserve less of uh, the punishment than they did before because they are less the same person, then we might be worried that this person is too psychologically disconnected to uh, be punished for the crime they committed. So you might imagine that your mother goes up to you and says, uh, you know that rule violation you committed when you were 10 years old? Well, I'm going to punish you right now. Uh, and your reaction to that might be, well, that's not in any sort of meaningful sense me anymore, mom, so let's, let's let this go. Uh, in addition to these concerns, consequentialist concerns might counsel for sooner rather than later punishment. The populace might fret about the possibility dessert won't be realized. Think of the friend who owes you money and hasn't paid you back yet. 
Additionally, we often incarcerate people for dangerousness or specific deterrence, and these sorts of consequentialist goods cannot be realized by waiting until later. Indeed, the intuitive thrust of the better now than later view seems to come from the thought that if someone is dangerous or her punishment will deter others or will lead to more deterrence of the offender herself, then we ought to get going on this punishment as soon as possible. Hence, the calculus here, like any calculus for balancing goods, may get quite complicated, even if retributive desert gives us no reason to prefer immediate imposition of punishment, there are concerns that do point in that direction. And of course, there are concerns that point in the opposite direction, including the ability to remedy or compensate for uh, false convictions. But retributive desert itself seems to have little to say about when punishment should occur. Consider now the question of how to punish. Tomlin thinks we have reason to select these shorter, swifter punishments as a temporal matter. But aside from the question of time, does retributivism restrict the manner of punishment? We think not. Retributivism itself does not tell us how defendants ought to suffer. Retributivism does not, in its best understanding, entail lex talionis, right, an eye for an eye. Suffering doesn't come in just one currency. Again, the parenting analogy here might be useful. Uh, one can take, if one's child misbehaves, you can take away electronics, you can send the child to bed early, you can give the child a time out, you can ground the child uh, from his favorite activity. It's not as though the misconduct entails a particular kind of suffering. So among possible punishments, there are several concerns that will come into play. There may be side constraints on how we can treat people such that we can't torture them. Consequentialist concerns, such as the expense or the negative side effects of one form of punishment as opposed to another, must also be considered. But ultimately, we believe retributive justice has little to say about how we punish. Finally, selecting among the deserving raises other questions. The state simply lacks the resources to punish everyone. I mean, we can start with a, a case in the positive desert realm, right? So if the state could award $1 to 1,000 children who all helped look for a lost dog, or $1,000 to one adult who helped look for a lost child, the adult's claim does appear to be stronger than the children's claims. But the distribution of positive benefits are by no means easy, particularly when we get to these sorts of aggregation questions. So theorists debate questions about in the healthcare sector, whether it would be better to prevent 10,000 headaches or 1,000 broken arms or one death. And our example of a trivial amount of dessert compared to a significant amount of dessert raises the same question, namely whether the aggregation of trivial amounts trumps one substantial amount. Of course, in one-to-one -one comparisons, the more deserving do seem to have a stronger claim to get what they deserve. The question is whether this follows for punishment. Do we think that among the deserving, we must punish the most deserving if we cannot administer all of the deserved punishment? That is, putting aside consequentialist reasons, if we have only one year's worth of incarceration to give out, should we give that to the murderer? Should we give that to the rapist? Should we give that to the burglar? And if we have a choice between 100 shoplifters or one carjacker, may we aggregate the former in lieu of punishing the latter. So in the real world, we're going to let consequentialist reasons decide this for us, right? The reason we go after serious offenses instead of minor ones is not because the state prosecutor has decided to go after the most deserving, but because she probably wants to go after the most dangerous. But from a theoretical perspective, we can see arguments on both sides as to the question whether retributive justice bears on the selection of the deserving. With limited resources, whom should we opt to punish first? So a uh, professor at the University of Maryland named Lee Kavorsky has a study about, uh, he actually has a draft paper about uh, how people are selected to be executed after, in fact, they've been sentenced to the death penalty and their appeals have run out. And what is particularly amazing or shocking about this is that there appears to be no set procedure and no rhyme or reason for selecting among the people who are death eligible. There's no actual procedure set. So then you could ask, well, what should the procedure be? And I, by the way, am just taking up the death penalty for purposes of argument. I'm not saying that the death penalty is an appropriate punishment. So there are a number of different ways we could do this. We could say, what is going to appease the populace the most? 
What's going to create the greatest general deterrence? What is the fair way to do this? Crossly, first in, first out. Or should there be selection by lottery? And some people think that retributive justice simply has nothing to say about this. The idea is that once you're picking among the people on death row, retributivism has run out and we need something else to break the tie. However, we think retributivists actually probably could have something to say about this. So a principle of Hitler goes first seems plausible to us. That is, even if 10 people deserve death, some might deserve it more than others, and the strength of the dessert claim seems to be a plausible way to select among the deserving. Of course, even if the strength of a dessert claim is a reason to pick one person over another, there might be other reasons uh, not to use relative dessert. Uh, one would be that so long as no one will be punished in excess of his dessert, we could have other stronger consequentialist reasons, right? So we might worry that because no one on death row really looks like Hitler, they all look quite the same, uh, then in fact it may look like an arbitrary abuse of power when we're trying to make these fine-grained distinctions. Something that has a fairer procedure, a fairer lottery, uh, may in fact be something that gives the populace greater comfort, even if one person might slightly deserve the punishment more than another. So, so far, I've pretty much argued about what retributivism doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us when to punish, it doesn't tell us how to punish, and it perhaps doesn't even tell us whom among the deserving to punish. But let me turn to another difficult distributive question. Retributive dessert is not distributed in a vacuum. Rather, distributive, retributive dessert will inevitably intersect with other distributions of benefits and harms. And my goal is not going to be to reconcile all of retributive and distributive justice. Indeed, some distributive justice views are simply antithetical with dessert, and others, although facially appearing to be congenial, adopt altogether different conceptions of dessert than the one at work with retributive justice. Nevertheless, the question remains whether retributive justice should ignore unequal distributions of benefits and harms. What if equally deserving offenders will suffer unequally under a given mode of punishment? What if an offender has experienced prior undeserved punishment or suffering? We are sympathetic to the views that these factors should be taken into account. Our current system of criminal justice presupposes ex ante fair, equal distributions in how suffering is actually going to be experienced. Of course, this isn't actually the case. Suppose Tom and Tina both commit offenses that merit 50 units of suffering. Tom's a wealthy celebrity, and one month in jail with the humiliation and degradation that Tom will suffer with the loss of his freedom is sufficient to get you to those 50 units. Tina, on the other hand, has, had, has been dealt a tough hand in life, and therefore she's accustomed to living in squalid living conditions and she's unknown to the public and will suffer no public humiliation by going to jail. It will take six months in jail to cause her 50 units of suffering. A short sentence for Tom and a lengthy one for Tina will bring about retributively deserved suffering for each. Yet it seems perverse to let the already fortunate Tom out of jail five months sooner than hard luck Tina. Have Tina's undeserved hardships hardened her and thereby ironically made her liable to a longer jail term than Tom's? Has Tom's undeserved good fortune softened him such that even a short stint in jail, which will be very painful, is the most punishment he should receive? So here, we side decidedly with Adam Kolber, who does argue that the subjective experience of punishment is what matters. Some theorists have argued that punishment is determined by the objective meaning, but the objective meaning in fact presupposes shared experiences. If we decided we wanted to punish all shoplifters by making them eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and that would be experienced as mildly unpleasant by 5% of the population, but enjoyed by 85%, and it would kill the 10% allergic to peanuts, then it seems that we would have failed to punish 95% of the population proportionately. It's only because we presuppose a shared set of preferences and vulnerabilities that we believe we know what each punishment means. Although there appears to be something perverse in saying Tom ought to be incarcerated for a shorter time than Tina, note that fines present the problem in the opposite direction. Should speeding tickets be a percentage of someone's income? Right now, speeding tickets are a trivial nuisance to the rich and are potentially devastating debts to the poor. 
We believe that there's a fix to this puzzle, no, not one that frees us from all the conundrums I'm about to address. Uh, and that is that the apparent perversity is really attributable either to the use of incarceration or to the use of fines. If there was a way to make sure that everybody experiences uh, the same level of suffering without having to worry about the unfairness of incarceration, we could use this form of punishment instead. I should say I think some of the same puzzles occur when we think about letting people uh, who are not dangerous out of jail, right? So if we say we shouldn't incarcerate people who aren't dangerous and we think that that makes sense as public policy, all of a sudden we start doing the studies on what correlates best with being dangerous and being likely to reoffend, and all of a sudden, you know, middle-aged, you know, I'm not a soccer mom, I'm a basketball mom, middle-aged basketball moms like me, you know, are, are sort of get no points on the Virginia scale of how long I should spend in jail, and someone else, like a young male, is much more likely to be seen as uh, potentially dangerous and have to go to jail. Now, the problem with that is the problem that we simply lack a way of punishing that makes sure that even if I'm not incarcerated, I actually suffer the same amount as the person who stays incarcerated because uh, he is in fact dangerous. We have just sort of so become wed to incarceration as the way to punish people that we somewhat lack the imagination to figure out a better way to even these things out. But the problem is that susceptibility to differential experiences is but the tip of the unequal distribution of suffering iceberg. So consider the following. Number one, actual innocence. The defendant was incarcerated for seven years for a crime she didn't commit. Case two, vigilante justice. The defendant was captured and locked in a basement for seven years by a band of vigilantes who aimed to punish the defendant for the crime she committed. Case three, torture. The defendant was captured and locked in a basement for seven years by a culpable actor who was unaware of the defendant's retributive desert that warranted seven years of incarceration. Case four, there won't be a quiz on this at the end. Case four, misfortune. The, defend, the defendant sentenced to seven years incarceration is on a plane to go to jail when it crash lands on a small island where the defendant uh, survives alone for seven years and it rains a lot. Case five, misery. Prior to committing an offense, the defendant's small plane crashes on, on, on an island where the defendant survives alone for seven years and it rains constantly. So we are inclined to say that in every single one of these cases, the suffering the defendant experienced should be set off against any incarceration by the state. We recognize that in taking this position, we do more than bite the bullet, we swallow it. Still, we reach this conclusion for several reasons. First, it seems plausible to us that desert claims can be set off against each other. So if you imagine a defendant who is incarcerated and in jail and then does something heroic that's warranting a positive uh, reward, such as rescuing fellow inmates and prison guards from a kitchen fire, one thing we might think that we're supposed to do then is to in fact let the defendant out earlier. Right? That's one way of sort of rewarding the defendant would be to compensate her with less time. Turning then to actual innocence, we have a case where the defendant experienced punishment at the hands of the state. Why shouldn't this count as the punishment she later deserves for her subsequent crime? We're not arguing that the undeserved punishment justifies her committing the criminal act, but we cannot see why this mistreatment by the state shouldn't count as credit. Indeed, if we change the punishment to fines, the case for offset becomes overwhelming. If Albert was incorrectly fined $10,000 by the state and later committed an offense for which he was sentenced to a $10,000 fine, then once the state determined its error, we'd simply say this was a wash. So what is different if the defendant is incorrectly sentenced to 10,000 hours of community service and then commits an offense that warrants a punishment of 10,000 hours of community service? Now this conclusion may initially seem to suggest there's something amiss with our view of retributive desert. After all, we seem to be arguing that there should be a world in which prior, prior suffering can mitigate or eliminate retributive desert, which might imply that crime is beneficial by virtue of its making undeserved suffering deserved and eliminating the imbalance on the defendant's moral ledger. Right? It's as if the message is wrongfully got convicted, go out and commit a crime, make everything right with the world, earn the time you've spent in jail. But this misses the fact that to balance her ledger, the defendant will have to risk harm to someone else. Harming another in order to balance her ledger is wrong. 
it runs afoul of the means principle. That is the deontological constraint that one is not allowed to use another person to produce good consequences. For instance, a surgeon is not permitted to carve up one healthy person and give that person's organs to five sick ones. So the world will not be better if the defendant offends. Indeed, the world will be worse because the undeserved suffering of the victim would be the means by which the defendant is trying to balance her ledger. Given that from the defendant's perspective, balancing her ledger requires using someone for an unjustifiable reason, she's going to act culpably. And thus, it remains the case that our view doesn't condone the commission of crimes for ledger balancing reasons. Indeed, this observation should temper, at least slightly, the counterintuitive nature of the claim. We are not denying that the later claim is wrong and the defendant culpable. Moreover, the defendant would be extremely culpable if her only reason for committing the later offense were to somehow utilize a get out of jail free card. It would take a very culpable person to say, having just spent all of this time wrongfully incarcerated, I want to go out and earn this time I have now spent in jail. This reason to commit the offense would render its commission more culpable than the typical case and deserving of more punishment. So now consider vigilante justice. Even if one accepts the position that the state has the exclusive authority to punish, this doesn't mean that if someone else punishes the defendant, that punishment does not count. To be sure, the vigilantes have acted wrongfully, at least insofar as they've failed to respect the state. But it is an altogether different question whether the defendant should suffer twice. Although criminal law scholars are sometimes skeptical of the vigilante's conduct counting as punishment, consider a far more sympathetic case. So in the self-defense literature, Jonathan Kwong and Joanna Firth imagine Fran, who is a resilient rape victim, who can't stop the sexual assault from occurring, but she can break her uh, attacker's wrist. If she's certain that the harm is unnecessary as a matter of defensive force, she knows for certain she can't actually stop the attack, what would justify her breaking his wrist, which seems so intuitively justifiable? So in addition to accounts that point to something like defending honor as its own independent value, some theorists have thought that part of what justifies Fran's behavior is that Fran is punishing Eric. Accepting that Fran is punishing Eric means that individuals have the ability to punish. Does that punishment then count as the punishment that the offender deserves. If Fran is punishing Eric, should the state punish him again? To be sure, there are times when multiple authorities each have the right to punish. A professional athlete who commits sexual assault might be sent to jail, divorced by his wife, ostracized by his friends, and fired from his job. Not all of these things are classic punishments, but the friends, for instance, may think that ostracizing the athlete is the fitting and appropriate response to rape. On the other hand, there are times when the fact that one authority has punished, that it impacts whether another authority should. So and you can tell that I have lots of experience with punishment in children from all my child examples. So uh, you might imagine that a mother gets the call, a call from school, that the child has done some sort of misbehavior, and that the school is punishing the child. Right, with some sort of, you know, in, let's say, you know, detention or something. Then the question I think that many parents ask is, okay, does that totally cover as much as this child should be punished, or should I administer additional punishment? Right, it seems as though there's some full amount of the punishment that the child deserves, and respecting that one authority has already given that punishment means that the other authority will not. To be sure, Defying school rules and defying your parents are two separate things, but I think that most parents will ask that question rather than go ahead and double the punishment. So in the cases under consideration, obviously the first actor is not an authority. Vigilantes aren't teachers or friends. Still, to us, it seems strangely insensitive for the state not to take this prior punishment into account. Even if the state has a monopoly on violence, an individual should not, punish, should not administer punishment. How does that undermine the fact that deserved suffering was imposed? Indeed, as Doug Husack has persuasively argued, there are reasons to take defendants' claims that they have already been punished enough seriously. 
So he was dealing with cases where somebody was, in fact, uh, quite well known and therefore suffered uh, significant humiliation as a result of the offender's fall from grace. So Cusack's responses are generally applicable here for our purposes. First, Cusack dispenses with the argument that the punishment is in the wrong mode as the defendant's not incarcerated. As Cusack notes, there's nothing about retributivism or punishment generally that entails incarceration. As I mentioned earlier, we completely agree with that. Second, Husak claims that the fact that punishment is not by the state is not disqualifying. Indeed, he notes that given that punishment, as he views it, involves vo both stigma and hard treatment, the state rarely has direct control over or gives precise content to the stigma. The stigma comes from the public's perception of the conviction. For Husak, punishment is partially constituted by the community's views of and reaction to the defendant's crime. Therefore, the state is never alone in meeting out punishment. Finally, Husek argues that because hard treatment and stigma are both components of punishment, a lot of stigma imposed by the, pun by the public should lessen the amount of hard treatment imposed by the state. We agree the psychological suffering, whether caused by stigma or hard treatment, should count towards the amount deserved. Finally, Given that, in the state of nature, we would all share the general right to punish, those who think that only the state may punish owe us an account of why this is so. They must show us that not only is it just for the state to acquire the exclusive right to punish, but also that, having acquired that right, punishment by others no longer counts towards giving the defender what he deserves. Now, in both actual innocence and vigilante justice, the punishers intended to punish. But that's not true in torture. The defendant has received suffering, but it's not done with an eye towards censure. Indeed, it isn't intended as punishment at all. The potentially justifying reason isn't even known by the torturer. Earlier, I argued that censure is not required for retributive desert. So we are inclined to say that if the defendant is harmed in accordance with her desert, then there is no need for the state to punish her afterwards. Now, one worry about saying this is that then it seems like the torturer is behaving justifiably. The torturer is giving the defendant what she deserves. That seems like we would be saying that the torturer is doing the right thing. Still, it's important to note two critical facts about torture. First, if the torturer is unaware of the justifying facts, then the torturer is culpable and, on our view, may be punished to the same extent as if the defendant were undeserving of suffering. Second, for rule of law reasons, neither the torturer nor the vigilante are entitled to administer punishment. Accordingly, they act unjustifiably, not because they give the defendant what she deserves, but because they usurp the state's role. I've thus proceeded as if the objection to counting the torturer's punishment is that the torturer is not the requisite authority. But there's another objection here. That is that the defendant has not forfeited her right against this kind of harming. Limited reasons accounts of rights forfeiture maintain that defendants don't forfeit rights against being harmed generally. Rather, they forfeit rights against being harmed by those who are motivated by or at least aware of the justificatory circumstances. Here, the punishment is warranted. That is, even if the defendant is owed punishment, only those who are aware of that fact are punishing her. As to everyone else, they are just harming her. So the limited reasons account has significant force. Indeed, I rely on it in my account of self-defense elsewhere. But let me grant you that the torturer can't be punishing because there's no intention to punish. I wonder how much turns on this concession. That is, one way to understand cases such as torture is that the defendant has already been punished. The other way to understand the case is that the defendant has suffered unauthorized harm, harm that she had a right not to suffer. But even if the latter is true and the torturer is not punishing the defendant, the question remains whether the defendant is entitled to set off the harm she has received. True, she wouldn't be able to say she's already been punished, such that punishment by the state is over punishment. But she would be able to claim that having suffered harm that she had a right not to suffer, she should not be able to let this harm, or she should be able to set this harm off against deserved suffering. Similarly, 
Uh, we can imagine the same approach to the unfortunate cases that some of us, I think, are familiar with when parents leave a child in the car. So they're, they're the cases where mom and dad, you know, mom, it's always mom's job to drop the child off at daycare. This is not from personal experience, by the way. It's always mom's job to drop the child off at daycare, but something's going on with mom's day, and so dad gets the job of dropping the child off at daycare. He's sleepy because children wake you up in the middle of the night multiple times, and he's driving to work on autopilot, and sleep, children fall asleep in cars, and what happens is dad winds up parking at work, dad forgets the child is in the car, and then the child dies. And uh, so there are always these questions about whether or not the, the father then would be deserving of punishment. So one way to say this is that he, in fact, already got, to the extent I actually don't think he's blameworthy or deserves punishment, but even if you think he does, that he already got what he deserved. But the second way is to say that having suffered an undeserved harm, there's now a reason not to give him what he deserves. So one way is to say it's already punishment. The other way is to simply say it's a harm, and having suffered this tremendous harm, now we have a reason not to give him the harm he would otherwise deserve. So we now turn to misery and misfortune. In misfortune, the defendant receives her deserved suffering after punishment is imposed but before it's carried out, and she receives the very same hard treatment that she would receive in prison. It seems to us she's getting her just desserts. And although the suffering and misery occurs prior to the criminal act, it's difficult to see why that should matter, leaving aside the fact that we would not want the defendant to opportunistically use her undeserved suffering as a set off against future wrongdoing. But we can think of no good reason why the negative desert one has incurred from a particular act should be viewed in isolation from all other desert bases in one's life. So let me turn quickly to one final question. That is, even if we think that undeserved suffering may be set off, there will still be the question of when the prior suffering is deserved. And I won't review all the ways in which suffering might be eligible for set off, but in closing, let me gesture it two times when I think there shouldn't be a set off. So first, sometimes the defendant acquires a duty to rescue because of her wrongdoing. So if I set fire to a building and Jeremy is now trapped inside, I have a duty to rescue him at significant cost to me. That cost, which is independently justified, doesn't count towards what I might later retributively deserve. Second, as alluded to earlier, these questions can arise in self-defense. We generally don't think that if the victim inflicts harm to prevent the defendant's action, the defendant is then entitled to set off that harm. This is because, likewise, the defensive action is independently justified. Notice that Fran and Eric is actually a different and special case because in that case, Fran can't justify her action as an action in self-defense because she knows it's completely, uh, it, will, it won't be sufficient to be able to stop him and therefore is treated as unnecessary. Hence, not all suffering can count for retributive desert. So in closing, if one is a retributivist and thinks it's good to give people what they deserve, one must confront a host of questions about its distribution. There are many times that retributivism has nothing to say about distributive questions, such as when, how, and perhaps whom among the deserving. On the other hand, to the extent the state aims to take into account whether someone deserves to suffer, it seems that a just state ought to take into account whether the defendant has previously been the victim of undeserved suffering, suffering that is already on her ledger or that makes her more susceptible to the particular harm of punishment. In an ideal world, the state would take these questions into account. Of course, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any need for retributive desert. We would only have to deal with the puzzles of distributing positive rewards. Thank you. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, so I look forward to your comments and questions. May I be the first to congratulate you on an absolutely fascinating lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was reading a, a David Delinko's review, actually, of your, your Crime and Culpability book, and one of the, uh, the, the uh, nice remarks you make about that book is the fascinating use that you make of examples and hypotheticals to make your point. And I think that was very evident in the course of this lecture. I was particularly struck, of course, by the um, repeated use of the example on someone on, on an island where it rains a lot. And, uh, <laughs> In the light of Brexit, you might think being stuck alone on an island where it rains a lot is mo most definitely suffering and punishment enough. But anyway, I will um, uh, uh, leave that subject alone now. Um, it's going on in another place. 
Uh, now, uh, um, there's normally a set of rules uh, of engagement about questions that reminds us to be civilized and uh, restrained and respectful and scholarly. Uh, I'm sure I won't need to remind you about all of those things in the light of what we just heard. Uh, uh, King's uh, talk invites just such a, a, a response. So, um, can I, uh, could, I, could I though remind you um, in a way that I'm not really doing very uh, well myself, but that is not to preface your question with too much by way of uh, 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 biography and previous information, but if you could just say briefly who you are and then ask your question, uh, we've still got plenty of time to go. So, could I open the floor to questions? Yes? Oh, um, basically, Charlie Rose. Al Franken, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, he's, Charlie Rose has lost everything. I mean, he's lost his interview shows, he's lost his reputation. He's, I mean, this is happening a lot, you know, suddenly, with a lot of people. So, so I had actually thought about whether I should mention even Charlie Rose specifically. And, and so I think one question, so assuming that some of what Charlie, I mean, some of what Charlie Rose did was simply inappropriate, and let's assume some of it's actually a crime of varying levels. And then I think that what we would do uh, as a matter of retributive justice is that we should, to some extent, take into account uh, some of the humiliation and some of what he has lost uh, as a matter of punishment. I don't think that all of that counts, so um, take, Take cases where, or that all of it is justified as, or, or even thought of as giving him what he deserves. So, so take, uh, you know, I think it was Tiger Woods who was found to be unfaithful and then lost a lot of endorsements or something like that. Is that right? Um, it's about as much as I know that. Uh, so, so there's this sense of like, well, is he being punished or is somebody being doubly punished? And you might simply say, well, part of what goes on is that when you lose endorsement deals, the only, you're a brand. And if you make yourself a brand and then you make the brand not particularly valuable, that's just simply market economics. So I think we have to be really careful about sort of when it is that what someone is doing is stigmatizing or humiliating somebody because they deserve it, and when it's sort of just that, well, now your brand isn't worth as much, and so we're going to fire you. And I, I take it that both of those things are probably going on with Charlie Rose. Does that, you seem unconvinced. I'm just confused the whole, I mean, it, the whole thing is just, sort of getting into, a, not, not what you're saying, but the whole situation is getting into a nutsy zone for a lot of, I think, what's happening feels that way. I, probably for a whole range of reasons that people are reacting for sort of different reasons and then that there are sort of different strains of what justifies different sorts of reactions. And so it's really hard to untangle what's going on and what's justified. Uh, for for any given individual act and for any given response to it. Okay, I've got, now I've got three. Um, I, I'm never going to remember the order of which people are unless I take things in batches. So I'm going to I'm going to take a batch of three questions. I think. Peter there, then the gentleman there, and then um, Emmanuel at the front here. So um, Peter. Can I interrupt you in the middle of here? Um, so Fran and Eric. <laughs> I slightly lost where, where you go, so you know, it's part of the question for clarity. So Fran, and, Fran raises risk. Now, I'm, there's a legal potential confusion there it's because it could be uh, reasonable force in self-defense that's ineffective. Although well, that's an interesting question, isn't it, legally, whether ineffective force can be reasonable, even though it isn't excessive. Um, but if we take it as a panic, you're looking at the level of morality, so uh, it would be, as I understand it, the punishment inflicted on the rapist morally. Uh, so, and yet legally, strictly speaking, what, she's, what could be interpreted as retaliation. So if we up the ante a bit and say he falls asleep in the trunk or something in the middle of an affair, so she, the woman gets out from underneath him and rapes him, assault by penetration, yeah, sorry for the grim example, but now we've got the next time going this, and um, that would be pretty straightforwardly retaliation, and she herself, I think, would become legally liable, this is not in self-defense at all. Um, and so then I couldn't quite understand where you were going. Why, from the moral retributive point of view, that's it. He's had his punishment, a rather severe one. Um, and so there's no argument. Am I right in understanding you as 
saying there's no particular reason why the state should be inflicting the punishment. Yes. Okay, so so that's that's really fun, one of my fundamental difficulties then with uh, moral retributivism is that, well, and if anyone can inflict punishment, go ahead, folks. So that is, it, are you saying that the, the effect, the implication of that are you an argument for vigilantes or, or, or private, the private exercise of punishment? So, um, no, because I think that rule of law values and making sure that we respect rule of law values means that vigilantes act wrongly vis-a-vis -vis the state, even if they don't act wrongly vis-a-vis -vis the person who deserves it. So I'll just back up for a moment and spend a minute with Fran and Eric. I think you've got it dead on. Uh, but uh, the, the puzzle starts as this puzzle of if the self-defense dares start with, well, if it's completely unnecessary, then in fact, uh, it's an unjustified harming. And so the question that actually Firth and Kwong ask is, can Eric break her wrist to prevent her from breaking his wrist, right? Which no one thinks he can, but then the sort of, the puzzle is, well, why? Or how is it that she's not behaving unjustifiably? And so people try, so, so one is just, well, it's really hard to get our head around, like she's 110% sure that this can't possibly stop him. That in fact, she really thinks it might possibly be defensive. But if you go along with the hypothetical, then you have to either say, well, she's defending something else, right? It's sort of right standing up to wrong and defending her honor, right? Which is one of the ways that someone like Helen Fro goes, or you think that there's something about, well, he deserves it, that justifies it a little bit. And Fro's objection to the dessert claim is exactly yours, which is, if you go that route, then it doesn't seem as though there would be a problem with what she calls deferred harming, right? You do it the next day. Um, and so then it seems as though she's not behaving justifiably at the time. So I'm inclined to say he deserves it. He deserves it at that moment. She's allowed to inflict it because he deserves it. Uh, at least in that sort of case, it's hard. I, I think she's at least excused in sort of not respecting rule of law values, something that three weeks later, uh, I still think that she would be giving him what he deserves. Uh, but that we as citizens uh, owe the state the, you know, and owe our fellow citizens, you know, going through the correct procedures and, and following uh, what we take criminal justice to be. Uh, but I still, I still think that we should see her, her wrong then as sort of usurping the role of the state as opposed to giving him undeserved harm. Jennifer. Uh, Michael Robillard, you hear of Center in Oxford. Uh, so I have a question about, I guess, um, about standing. Um, so I'm thinking in, in the defense literature with respect to liability, the thought is with other defense, um, if Jones is a pacifist and Smith is attempting uh, to kill Jones, I'm not allowed to, to kill Smith on Jones' behalf, at least on some views, uh, unless I'm authorized by Jones to do so. And if He's a pacifist, and I go ahead and I, I kill Smith on his behalf, and I've somehow wronged Jones by sort of um, killing and, and not regarding his, his consent or his authority. So assuming a case or most accounts where liability and desert are, are symmetrical expressions of justice, one being ex ante and the other being ex post, I'm curious a case where, let's say, um, Fran gets raped, and then the state is the entity that's the, the <coughs> personal proxy, so to speak. And Fran says, you know what, I'm, I'm more a New Testament than an Old Testament kind of person. I believe in mercy and forgiveness. Um, it's my decision, don't punish them. Sometimes sinners are, you know, they're just sinners. On your view, to what extent is the desert owed to Jones somewhat open-ended or contingent upon the subjective prerogative of the, the person being offended? Or, or not at all? Not at all. Really? Yeah, okay. So, so, so okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Wait, do you, did you have more? You want me to explain so, that? So would Fran be doing something wrong if Fran chooses to, to say, no, I believe in forgiveness? Well, so I, so I think there's two, there are a few things there. One, I'm not sure that I would agree with you that the sort of mirror image of self-defense is punishment. In fact, I think that really the sort of self-defense looks a lot more like 
corrective justice. I, I think in one paper I say it's sort of like tort law with the time machine. You just go back in time and distribute the harm to the person you'd, you'd prefer to suffer it ex ante. Uh, but to me, what makes someone deserving of punishment uh, is to, in fact, uh, engage in an action that manifests insufficient concern for the interests of others. And so it's not, it doesn't actually matter whether if I shoot you and you're sleeping and never know about it, I've still demonstrated, right, I miss you, obviously, if you're sleeping and never know about it. Um, it, it doesn't actually matter uh, whether or not there is a victim or what the victim is aware of. All of it is about my choosing to reveal that I don't, I don't take other people sort of seriously and I'm willing to harm them for, or risk harming them for bad reasons. Uh, Fran, on the other hand, might, uh, might certainly could decide that she doesn't want to be the person to engage in punishment, right? She doesn't have to be the person to engage in punishment. That's the state's job to engage in punishment. So I think she's entitled to say, I'm not going to take it upon myself to punish someone, or even I don't really want to take part in this, although I think sometimes the state forces you to take part in these things anyway. Uh, but to me, retributive justice really isn't about sort of grounded in some sort of victim's entitlement. Does that fully answer? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Come uh, Emmanuel Biak is from the Law Department. Um, could I get you to tell us a little bit more about um, what your position entails as to, whether, on, on the question of um, must punishment come um, soon and sharply or in the end? Um, and one intuition that I had here is that um, in thinking about when retribution should come, and if there are limits to when the state can hold, you know, how long the state can hold out before they punish the person. I'm thinking more in terms of blameworthiness. I think that if I have wronged you, um, I may deserve a certain battery of reactive attitudes on your part, but there also seems to me to be something of a timer um, set by the moment on the moment of the wrong, that you cannot be holding that out for me uh, for as long as you want, as long as in, provided that in the end uh, that set of reactive attitudes is, is uh, sort of hits me. And the thought is that once I have, um, this is a way of torturing me, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, by holding out, not punishing me um, in the way I deserve, you're holding something over my head, a sword over my head, and that in itself um, is something object I have reason to object to, even if I wouldn't be able to object to the punishment itself. And I wonder whether you want to accommodate that intuition in your account, or do you think it's, it's sort of illusory? No, I think I, I agree with that, and that might itself be sort of a form of, in, of suffering that you're then inflicting. Right? The clearest cases of this are the sort of death row cases where the person is just waiting and waiting, and then the question is, is waiting actually a fate worse than death to just sort of wake up every day and never know is today the day I'll be executed might actually be worse than simply being executed. Uh, and, and so actually one thing Kavorsky was sort of struggling with, but it was sort of a separate retributivist question, is sort of what's the worst punishment here? Is it the holding over the head or the actual imposition of the sentence? So I wasn't inclined with the in the end view to sort of say, oh, look how great it is we get to dangle the you owe us over your head as much as sort of imagining that a defendant who deserves, let's say, to go to jail for three years, uh, but because of the position he's in at that particular moment and is not otherwise dangerous, right, could accomplish certain things and then report to jail three years later, right? Do we then have a reason to say, no, it's got to be now? Or as long as he serves his time three years from now, would that be equally permissible? So there I think retributivism should, should be agnostic as between now and later. Other reasons can, can dictate towards pushing it to later. But I agree with you that to the extent that the defendant would experience a delay as actually increased suffering or an increased burden on the defendant, I do think that that would matter. I'm thinking that in your example, uh, the one you gave just now, if I may, sure. uh, I will commit you on this occasion. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, maybe the, the, the proper description of the reasons is that we have, the state has reason to administer the punishment um, soon and sharply, 
And that reason is then outweighed by whichever reasons um, the accused has, the convicted person has, of saying, look, I'm in the middle of something really important. Let me finish this. And then I come and suffer my punishment. So the, the, de the moral default in the position that I have in mind would be do it swiftly and sharply. Um, unless there are reasons why we should allow the, the convicted person to finish a project. Um, let's say, for example, raising a kid. Um, the, the kid is like a few months old. Let me raise it for a certain amount of time so that they won't need me. Um, and then I suffer that. That, that. But that doesn't seem to be the way you're thinking about it. Yeah, and, and so I guess I would want to know what reason the state had for soon and sharply that is independent of this sort of additional suffering kind of view that the idea of that it's it's wrong to hold it over people's heads <coughs> just for that it, it just it, that in itself is something we shouldn't do mm -hmm. except when so I, I guess I like that. I, I want to think more about it. I just think that it may just be that they're all different reasons that pull in different directions, that then it's not a reason related to retributivism, but something else that's going on that gives us reason for imposing it now. I just want to see whether it would emanate from retributivism or from outside it. Let me think about that. Okay, I'm going to give a bit of priority to people who are not actually members of the law department because it's uh, so. What I, but in, in terms of the order which we are, uh, the lady there, uh, the, no, uh, you, uh, um, well, strict uh, in strict in the strict order of which I, I have things in mind. Actually, it's Nikki. It's Nikki next. So do you I want do to? I do have a question, but this lady has a finger, I think, besides me on this point. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Then. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, what was the what was the reason that I get Well, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Go no, ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I shouldn't be prioritised. Um, I'm not not a legal academic. I have done a television program about the subject years and years ago, uh, when I first started as television journalist, looking at uh, retribution and so on and so forth, alternatives to prison and um, what are the reasons from a philosophical point of view. Um, and I'm interested in the philosophical arguments as well, but also the consequentialist ones where. Um, we know that a lot of people who commit terrible acts um, are not necessarily mentally deficient, but they don't have um, uh, any kind of morals at all. They sort of haven't had any proper training, but they are also born in a... In a and we know that people's brains um, have potential to be... Um, you know, there's a very large number of people, who tend to rise, who have potential to be criminals from the word go and they have those sort of brains. So what I'm thinking about is when you punish those people, they don't realize that they've done something wrong particularly, they don't really care. And um, if you punish them in the way that you've been talking about retribution for, its, for the sake of giving them some punishment, not necessarily, obviously we have to protect the, the public and we have to make sure that other people don't uh, are deterred from the deterrence aspect, that's absolutely true. But you might find that some of these people I'm talking about um, hold a terrible grudge against society for having been punished. They don't believe they should have been, and they actually will behave worse when they are uh, released from prison or whatever punishment was. So as an after effect, the, the result for society is worse than it might have been if you hadn't given them punishment. Maybe you would have trained them um, to learn a little bit about what they've done as being wrong, giving them something to contribute to society, like making work as an alternative to prison for society in some way, in the various schemes that there are. And the, the actual question about retribution really is, is something that in those cases uh, is more, um, I mean, pros and cons, is, is worse than the alternative. So, what do you think so I don't deny that we may think that retributive justice, even, even if it is intrinsically good, as I think it is, can be outweighed by the bad consequences that can come from it. So uh, first, I think actually most retributivists, maybe even all retributivists at this point, think 
well, we don't have to be sort of monomaniacally, to quote Michael Moore, sort of focused on uh, retributivism. We can say uh, we should invest in healthcare and we should invest in these things instead of investing in criminal justice to begin with. But even in terms of the criminal justice system, certainly the fact that we will do more harm than good, right, weighs against giving somebody what they would otherwise deserve. I think what the retributivist wants to say, though, is that there are going to be times where Maybe it just doesn't seem as though there are a lot of positive benefits that will come from it besides giving the person what they deserve, right? And is that, in some ways, itself a sufficient reason to punish? And there are going to be times when we think that is true. So the example that's used, and I think it cheats in a few different ways, but is that you imagine, some, well, it was a real case of someone who had actually um, abducted a woman uh, assaulted her and, and sexually assaulted her and robbed her. And afterwards, when being sentenced by the judge, the judge said, I don't care if you just spend one day in jail and then they let you out on probation. And so we're then asked to imagine that there's no sort of general or specific deterrence that would come from it, no incapacitation. You can add all the facts in that get you there. And then you say, do I still think this guy should go to jail because he deserves it? And the intuition is supposed to be, yes, I still think that that's a good enough reason to punish. But I don't, I don't remotely deny uh, that there will be times when so much harm or, or more harm will come than good uh, and that therefore we shouldn't punish. I don't disagree with that. Okay. Um, you, gentleman then wants to ask a question. Uh, Nikki, do you want to cut in at this point? No, no, no. Here we are. Okay. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to sort of bring in a practical consideration that I know was, was, was part of the conversation earlier, and that was this idea of the scarcity of punishment and, and sort of see where this pushes us. Because uh, if, if I got it right, my understanding was that uh, it's, it's a good thing if we can dole out as much deserved suffering as possible. Uh, and <laughs> if the state has limited resources, maybe this, this suffering maximization principle uh, should be something that we rely on to determine how people are punished. Uh, and I wonder if this pushes us towards you know, simplistic forms of punishment, forms of punishment that, um, uh, that maybe aren't as, that are sort of more objectively shared as experiences. Uh, in other words, my question is, is there, is there sort of a retributive uh, inclination when you bring in this angle uh, towards punishments like, like corporal punishments or death or pain or those sorts of things? Because I think that's sort of a concern that, that opens up. Right, so if, I think a retributivist is going to have to ask the question, what are the kind of side constraints on how we treat other human beings such that this should not be a form of punishment? I think we should just be perfectly clear that what we do now is we lock people in cages in incredibly atrocious conditions, and that to sort of take the, well, what, you know, oh gosh, corporal punishment, that would be horrible. Well, what we do now is, you know, horrible. And, and therefore, one paper I haven't written and one day would like to write is sort of the, the, you know, question of what should be on the table, what are the kinds of punishments that should, we should be thinking about, and those will always be constrained by, you know, what is good enough to count as suffering and punishment, which is what we want, and yet is not disrespectful to people as persons. And, and that's gonna just be a, a tension. But I, I think we, before we poo poo something, I'm not, you know, this is not a talk in favor of corporal punishment, but before we poo poo something like that, we should be incredibly clear on what we do right now. Uh, now, where are we? Let me see. Yeah, Yucker. Well, I think Nikki was. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you want to be. I'm very, I'm very happy. No, 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 no. I think you've waited. You've waited. Yeah, uh, I'm Nikki Lacey. Very, very beautifully constructed and, and great to listen to. So, my question really is this: um, on this morally retributive view, if it doesn't matter whether it's the state who inflicts the suffering that is deserved, where does conviction fit in? Where does the process of trial proof, some past trial, but proof and conviction fit in? Is that in a, in a completely different sphere of justification? That, that not part of the picture, um, which, you know, that, that I'd just be interested to see what, where that fits in, and in part because, secondly, and this might be, you, you 
you, you packed a lot in, and I might not have followed every twist of your argument, because this and that's you being at the end of the day. Um, the Tim and Tina example, mm -hmm. where background disadvantage increases or decreases the, the, the impact of the penalty, your argument about that. What if the background advantage or disadvantage affects the chances of somebody giving in to the temptation to commit an offence? Does that, is there, or is that just all in a different sphere of you know, things going to conviction as opposed to things going to punishment? Because it strikes me as, it's just really interesting because a lot of the neo jurist tradition has been very much, you know, having a composite argument, hence the censure argument about the trial, the, the, you know, the conviction stage, and you know, what justifies that, and then what follows from that in terms of punishment. But you seem to be, if I've understood right, potentially separating those in quite a radical way. So, um, I think that the trial does become something different. I think it does, I think in some ways feed into my answer to Peter's question in terms of sort of rule of law values and why we would want to make sure that we are uh, only punishing the guilty and make the populace feel comfortable about that and the, the sort of reasons we have things like proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but none of that is going to be inherent in my view of retributivism. Uh, the background temptation question is tough. I kind of, because I'll probably answer that differently depending upon how the background temptation gets filled out. Right? So there may be times that I think that's undeserved suffering that in some ways counts as set off against something later. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to take some, I, I have some, I have the view that there's a certain minimal level of sort of rationality and volitional control that you need and after that you are eligible to be blameworthy uh, for having committed the offense. And so to that extent I'm not going to care about why different or, or some differences in in background temptation uh, or at least th these sorts of questions won't intersect those questions so i guess the answer is neither of those winds up falling within this <laughs> did the uh, mic just turn on i feel like it's my voice is now reverberating it's just oh I'll, I'll lean back <laughs> okay, now what, what, I, what I'm going to do, I, I've got a question from the lady there, and then I'm going to take, and after that I'm going to take um, sort of questions uh, together, as it were. So if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, uh, my name is Susan Berry, I'm in the philosophy department here at the university. So I'm sympathetic, or, uh, part of me is a retributivist, but then part of me thinks I'm not, so I'm just going to tell you a story. Uh, I booked a train to Scotland and I was very careful to book the quiet coach because I wanted to get work done. And then it just so happened that like opposite of me there were two old ladies and they just kept chatting. So for like an hour I just kept quiet, I think I can still get work done. Then I realized I simply I cannot get work done, partly because I'm getting worked up um, by the fact that it's a quiet coach, it's clearly labeled and they just have the audacity to keep talking. So I went up to them and I asked them whether they could continue the conversation in a different coach, possibly. And then they said, yes, sure. And so I went back to my seat and they started chatting again. And they kept chatting all the way um, to Edinburgh. So uh, the retribution in me, it's just, it's obvious that uh, if they get off the train and I see them trip, I'm going to be pleased. I mean, that's not good, but it's an intrinsic good if there's But I would be, I would have been, or if I see that they miss their connection or something, like, yes, that's how the world should be, right? But um, then, if I imagine remorse coming in, so I can see that suddenly they realize what they did is wrong and they come up to me and they apologize, and then I see them miss the connection, then it would just be petty of me to still feel like, yes, they had it coming because they did something wrong. So the bigger question is just, uh, does remorse play any role at all? I mean, you can also do the W. The Ross um, experiment, so I imagine a world where some people who did bad things, but like if they were transparent to themselves, to us, they truly they did whatever they have to do to feel bad about it. They felt remorse, they, they, they wouldn't do it again. Um, and then it can be a world where they suffer or a world where they have reasonably good lives. It would just be petty to say that they should be suffering somehow. So does remorse 
do something to extinguish the need to inflict harm. Maybe accepting punishment is evidence for the fact that the perpetrator um, realizes that he or she has done something bad. So, I don't know, any thoughts? Okay, so first, um, I'm just so with you uh, on... I yelled at people on the quiet car, <laughs> I think on the way to Edinburgh or on the way back, like, like tapped the woman multiple times, this is the quiet car. And yes, if her luggage had fallen on her head, I would have been super happy, uh, which proves that I am a retributivist. Um, so I, I think that, you know, part of what, when I feel badly about the things that I have done where I sort of deserve punishment, I don't think that the sort of guilt and remorse that I feel isn't then suffering, right? So part of it may just be, I mean, you pick something that's, that's kind of a, a trivial wrong to which it wouldn't take a lot for the person to have to suffer to feel badly about it, right? We don't really want, you know, you wouldn't want, you know, them to be decapitated suddenly, right? It, you know, you just want them to trip or something. and, and you know, not even that badly, because they, they might be fragile. Um, but, but something where it's like, yes, karma. Uh, but if they, if they actually recognized it, and then on the way home, you know, talked about how badly they felt, I think that you would think the fact that they were sort of internally suffering and is part of why it is now okay. So I guess I think that the remorse view is in some ways tied to a recognition of, not just a recognition of wrongdoing, but sort of a, a self-punishment of sorts. Uh, now, Peter, you've gone to the bottom list of priority because you've already asked a question. So uh, if I could ask this gentleman here and Jaco perhaps to ask both, if they could both ask their question, then you could, you say you could round up uh, okay. on those two, uh, first of all. Go ahead. Yeah, in your, in your discussion, State taking into account uh, prior um, punishment for suffering. Uh, you gave the example of the mother worrying about if the child had received sufficient punishment at school. Um, when I was at primary school and I was naughty, my mother would often punish me when I got home. Um, <laughs> but the reason why she punished me was not so much um, her concern about the school's sort of moral framework that I gone against but, but her own moral framework and her own values I think that um, I wasn't listening to or weren't sinking in and she was punishing me I guess for breaking her kind of moral framework. So in a sense I guess her justification, the justification would be that my, the crime I committed had effects within sort of two jurisdictions. So I was wondering if that is relevant to, to the discussion um, and in a sense if you, if you commit a crime against an individual, uh, like a sub, for example, you could argue that um, you committed something against the individual, but also a crime against the state as well. So it seems to me that the state then would have justification in administering punishment. Okay, well, if we could hold that thought, which is a very good one. Yeah, thank you. Great. Oh, yeah, now I feel bad. But um, uh, from the long apartment, my, my question is, as a matter of, sort of historical experience alone, it seems there's no upper limit on possible blameworthiness. But is it fair to say that there is an upper limit on the amount of suffering that can be inflicted? Because it seems to me that there, there is. And, and I'm wondering, A, does that asymmetry do anything for, cause any problems for general retributivist account, in particular because my intuition would be that if the upper limit on suffering that can be imposed on people is comparable or more or less similar across people, does that then not turn the account into a relative account, sort of indirectly? But I, I, it's just an intuition that I can't... Um, yeah. okay, do you want to come back on uh, both of those, whichever sure. order suits you? Okay, I'll, I'll, so, um, we have a whole separate chapter on the question about um, sort of volume discounts and mass murderers and recidivists and how to do this number calculation, which winds up raising all sorts of problems, right? Including, you know, that if somebody commits some sort of theft, multiple theft crimes, can they wind up deserving more punishment than somebody who's committed one murder? And there's I think there are all kinds of questions about aggregation, not just about the sort of metric of suffering, but just what do we do when we get to sort of the fact that as human beings with finite lives, we can simply deserve more 
than anyone could ever administer. And if ought implies can, then how ought you to punish somebody more than they can possibly deserve? And uh, uh, we, we somewhat toy with these things without coming to sort of any great conclusion, uh, except, well, if you imagine that people went to heaven and went to hell, that you would think that there are people who deserve more time than one before they get to, to, to leave, that, depending upon their crimes. Uh, but with sort of imperfect short lives, we're going to have problems with, with any of these aggregation questions. Uh, so I like, um, I, I do think it matters quite a bit, sort of when the mom punishes, sort of what's the grounds for the punishment. So sometimes it's sort of a school rule. You violate the school rule. Did the school take care of it? Now we're done. And sometimes it's, I told you to listen to that teacher. I told you not to get him upset. We've gone through this five times. And so it's not just that the teacher's punishing you. I'm punishing you for the fact that you didn't listen to what I told you to do vis-a-vis -vis the teacher. So I absolutely agree with you that there could be two authorities with two separate duties that you owe them. Um, I suppose I'm less inclined to think that what defendants owe is owed to the state. I think the state really doesn't have as much of a role in my view of uh, punishment. And so I think that uh, you know, when I ki it, when, if I were to kill someone, uh, that would be uh, something that I did against that victim and would reveal that I'm culpable, but it's not as though it's, it's two separate wrongs, one to the victim and one to the state. It's one wrong uh, that, that the state would then be punishing me for. So, so that's why I wouldn't see those as always giving rise to two separate and distinct punishments that are deserved. Although I agree with you, there will be cases where different authorities have different contents of duties owed to them, where then uh, multiple punishments would be appropriate. Okay. Uh, Andy and Peter. Um, Andy Summers also from the Law Department, but I, I thought I'd better let um, the criminal lawyers ask questions first. And my, my question is um, not uh, inspired by the criminal law, but another context that I've been thinking about with um, dessert um, in relation to deserve, deserving good things, um, and in particular in the, in the context of tax. And so, uh, and I think that this might, that the, the question at the end of this will be whether there is any mirror image here or not, really. But, um, so taxing the, the rich, I mean, there's lots of reasons you might give for that to redistribute money to the poor and so on and so forth. But one reason that, that has some provisional attraction to me is the intrinsic dessert point of the idea that some rich people just don't deserve the amount of money that they have. Okay? So something intrinsically good in reducing the amount of money that they have, even if you were just to burn it or something. Um, I mean, fortunately, you're not normally in practice forced to make that kind of choice because you can redistribute it. But anyway, um, the, the, the idea is that um, then your currency of dessert being suffering doesn't seem to map quite onto that because it's not that by taxing the person or punishing them or trying to make them worse off, you're saying you don't deserve what you have and the tax is operating to restore the truly deserved position or something like that. And so I'm wondering whether there's any mirror image in, in relation to criminal punishment where instead of saying that the punishment is to inflict suffering, Maybe something like in term, in relation to incarceration, for example, but so, something like um, you don't deserve to be able to participate freely in society or something like that. So it's not the aim of the punishment is not to inflict suffering, but to restore them to some kind of truly deserved position in light of what they've done. Does that make sense? So I think that you and may I answer that? Oh, do you have to? Okay, so I think that you. The problem is that we use the word dessert so promiscuously in sort of different uh, contexts. So deserving to win a race is not the same kind of thing as deserving punishment. And I think that you are trading on a different notion of sort of when, when someone's entitled to something and it's deserved compared to the notion I'm using uh, in criminal law. I do think that there can be tax implications, right? I mean, we could actually think that we should 
have a system that, I mean, why have a world of sticks if you could have a world of carrots, right? Like, let's tax, and instead of using it on prisons, let's give people things when they do good, right? I mean, I actually had my research assistant look into like, what are, when do we ever give good things? And it seems that we actually only do that if we think there's some instrumental value, right? Something like a scholarship is really intended to keep people local or something like that. But you could ask the question, if the state is in the business of distributing what would be the mirror image, right? Should we even be thinking about rewards instead of punishments? But I think your notion of dessert is trading on a potentially different notion than the notion I'm dealing with. Okay, final question, Peter. Sorry, make it a good one. Um, so your answer to the two jurisdictions question means that the state, for a moral retributivist, is merely or is the representative of the victim. So that, that was the first point. Second, just to press you on um, Nikki's question, because I had it in my mind. That why you, how can you resist the social justice critique uh, if you accept that subjective vari variation in, in uh, social experience determines the amount of punishment after conviction? Why doesn't it affect the culpability prior to conviction or at the point of conviction? Why isn't it a concern subjective experience of social experience would lead people to make different decisions, uh, uh, react in different ways in particular factual contexts? as a result of undeserved experience, that surely also ought to make it uh, uh, have an impact on the amount of punishment deserved. It might only mitigate, um, but as Barbara Hudson suggested, it ought to mitigate um, uh, where, where appropriate on your, own, on your own logic. So you kind of cut it off with in the client in it, but I'm not sure you can. Uh, so I guess on the first one, I just don't want to you're right that the state drops out of my account. I wouldn't want it to necessarily drop out of everyone's. You said moral retributivist, so at least the yeah. Fersander, as Larry and I are sometimes called, view. Yes, but not necessarily everyone. Um, I guess I'm a little worried that the social critique gets us too close to determinism if we have to take it all into account and if we think that there's a sort of choice at which people can be held responsible that should matter for sort of that they are blameworthy. I still think I could say some ex ante undeserved uh, uh, harms or, or undeserved deprivations can be set off or should count, but I don't think I want to make it just because it's harder for some people than for others, so long as it's sufficiently easy for everyone that those sorts of things necessarily mitigate punishment. I think I can draw that line. Maybe you'll convince me afterwards that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a fascinating. Thank you so much all for your questions. But uh, one thing I'm absolutely sure about is you certainly deserve another round of applause. So. <laughs>